to hear the, uh, to listen to the exhortation that we got as a church. Uh, the concern of the pastor for the young people. I just want to mention a couple of things because I am, I know some things about young people in the church. 85% of the people or the young people that comes to church, when they go to college, they leave the faith in the United States. Many, many of them, once they leave their home, they stop going to church. And it's very sad because this country is being established in the principles of the Word of God. And that's why we are in the problems that we are in, as a country. Our problem is not Syria, our problem is not the economics, our problem is that we have forgot who is king of kings. That's our problem. I mean, I'm going through some experiences that I is still asking the Lord, what is he trying to tell me, to show me, because uh, since I left the hospital, and that's way uh, over a month already, the Lord has been waking me up very, very early in the morning. To be specific, he wakes me up at 3.20 in the morning. Don't, don't, don't ask him why not 3.25, not 3.15, not 3.30, 3.20. And today was my exception. Now, once I wake up, I don't like to stay in bed. So I got up and uh, I've been getting up and go to my little office and uh, start praying and reading the word of the Lord. To this exercise, I, I, I encountered in the book of John two passages that really felt that the Lord was talking to my heart. And, uh, as I started meditating in those passages, I realized how careful I have to be as to when I get a passage in the Bible, not to assume that that's all that it is about that particular subject. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, one verse in the Bible is one of the most well-known verses of, in the church found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, in which the Lord has declared that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that nobody comes to the Father but by Him. So I did read the book of John for, I figured about no less than 50 times. I read chapter 14, in chapter 13. But I believe that you cannot understand chapter 14 unless you read chapter 13. Now please don't laugh about me because I, I'm a kind of fanatic about the Word of God if you want to call me. And I don't think that you can understand chapter 13 unless you study Luke 22. And I don't think that you understand Luke 22 Unless you understand what it says in Hebrews 9, 20, the 22nd verse, that without the shade of law, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, the reason I'm bringing to you all this picture is because as you read chapter 13 and 14 of the book of John, you cannot help it to feel sad, at least I do. I do. Because it presents a very sad picture about the human condition. Chapter 13 is well known because it's when the Lord washed the, the feet of the disciples. Everybody knows that chapter in the church. What very few people realize is that uh, the purpose of that, and the, the way that the disciples were totally unaware of who do they, they were with and what the Lord was trying to teach them. When we come to those two chapters, 
It's about the end of the ministry of the Lord. Three years have gone by. They are celebrating the Passover in the upper room. And they are there arguing to see who is going to be first and who is going to be what once the Lord is going to be established the kingdom. They are arguing among themselves. And it's a sad picture because they all have come to celebrate the Passover. And of course, that last supper is not like the museum, the Leonardo da Vinci a picture, because they don't have a table. In those days, they didn't have tables. They are laying down on the floor. That's what they do. They did. And uh, they all have their feet dirty. And nobody cared about that. Now, let me, let me give a short explanation. When, in those days, when you were invited to a house, to a home, to, to have something to eat, or to, well, for whatever reason you came, there was a person right at the entrance of that home. And he was the lowest person in the, in, in the uh, scale, social scale, of that particular place. Probably a slave or even a, a person that had no say in anything. And that person was directed to wash the feet of the people that came to that house. It was a humiliating task. Now these disciples had come, have come into the upper room and nobody has noticed that everybody has their feet dirty. And you're going to say to me, well, Pastor Carlos, you're making a big deal about the dirty feet. Well, yes and no. You have to realize, of course, that the roads in those days were not like today. But that represents that we, as we walk in the world, we get our feet dirty. For the things that we get contaminated and the things, the places that we go and the, the things that we learn. That's what it shows you feet dirty. You walking in a dirty world, in a filthy world, full of concepts that are not conducive to have a relationship with God. I am an anti-religious person. Everybody knows that in this church right now. I'm very concerned about religious ceremonies that men establish in certain dates, in certain months, when it comes, for example, to the communion of the saints. We celebrate communion here in the United States, not only in this church, in the United States of America, the first Sunday of every month. Usually the pastor or whoever is directing the service says, if you have anything against anybody, ask the Lord to forgive you, and then you have communion. In other words, have a quick fix, and then you have communion. To get your feet dirty takes time. You can you feel dirty? You get so accustomed to that that you even go to bed and you feel dirty. And it becomes a manifestation of how much you care. They were there, they were arguing. The Lord is saying to them, He's announcing to them that He's going to depart. He's not mentioned the cross by him specifically in Azul in the chapter. That he is saying that he is going to go and pay the price for us. He is going to go and fulfill the law. He is going to go and shed his blood for us. It's a tremendous passage in the Bible. I'm going to say to you again, if you want to understand that passage, then you also have to read chapter 6 of the book of John. 
because he has announced that if you don't, in that chapter, chapter 6, he has announced that if you don't drink his blood and eat his body, you're not worthy to follow him. And many, many people who were following him got all confused about him, was the way that he was talking and led. And then he turned around to his disciples in chapter 6 of the book of John and said to them, How about you guys? Do you want to leave also? If you want to leave me. The example that God has given us to that passage is the picture of redemption. He is there with his disciples at the end of three years. In chapter 13, because nobody has noticed that they have the been dirty, he gets up and starts washing each one of them. And we all know, because this passage is so well known, we know the reaction of Peter. You don't wash my feet, and the Lord said, if you don't want it, if you don't wash, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, then you have no part with me. And then the Peter goes into the other extreme. Then you wash me all. Still doesn't understand. That's the problem with religiosity. See, he was a Jew. And by that I mean I'm not trying to, to resolve it. Race of being a Jew, but by, by saying that he was a Jew is because they were very, 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 and they still are religious people. They were all superficial rights. They still don't get it. He still don't get it. The day he gets up and he says, as we go to chapter 13 of the book of John. In verse 34, in the 34th verse of chapter 13, a new commandment I give you to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also may love one another. Then he added in this passage, you have noticed that I have washed your feet. And then he says, I am the teacher, and I'm washing your feet. You should do one to, the, to another the same thing. They still don't get it. Please read the passage real slow. They are not listening. The key of the relationship with God is the forgiveness of our sin through the blood of Christ. The key of the relationship with anybody else, according to the Bible, is to love one another. You don't do anything in the body of Christ unless you allow God to teach you how to love one another. Right in those two chapters, you see 13 people, 12 people, excuse me, arguing to see who is going to be what. They are not asking us to, what is your need, brother? Or nothing, no. And then the Lord, knowing that he, the, the one who's going to betray him, is there, he tells that one, Judas, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. The one thing that I notice as you read those two chapters is that he also watched the feet of Judas. He didn't make an exception. He washed the feet of the, of the person that betrayed him. I 
put myself there, you see. There are times in your life where you're going to be betrayed. There are times in your life when you have great expectations about something or some people. And all of a sudden that person or that situation turns to be exactly the opposite of what you were expecting. And unless you allow God to teach you through these passages as to how you can be able to not only forgive but to help and to do good to those who do harm to you, your relationship with the Lord and with God is nothing but a religious relationship. It has nothing to do with what the Bible talks about. I am really concerned about some things. Friday night I went to talk to somebody. A man that has spent most of his life in church. Very active in a very rich church. And he is so bitter against that church because they are not acting the way that he thinks that they should act regarding some problems they need as in common. And then he said to me, I know that you know some Bible and that's why I call you. And let me ask you, I'm going to tell you, please don't quote some verses to me because I'm going to get angry. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, we don't have to explain, waste our time. I'm going to leave because And he said, well, no, no, wait, let, let me explain to you. I said, no, you don't have to explain anything. You are a bitter person. You are full of hate. It's so obvious. And God is giving you the tremendous opportunity to learn to forgive and to love those who have heart. And it will transform your life if you allow God to do that for you. Because you cannot do it by yourself. Because it has to be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you have to stay still for a while, allowing God to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Because you or yourself cannot produce that. You are incapable. You don't have that power. This is a place for for a couple of minutes, I'm going to mention the name of the person because he told me it's okay. Dennis came here Saturday. How many know Dennis? I know exactly where Dennis is because I've been there. I know exactly where he is. It's a person full of addictions. I was there. It's a person full of hate. I was there. And so he says, can I talk to you? As I was leading, he says, can I talk to you, a pastor? I said, sure, you can talk to me. And he started giving me the same song. They know, I said, no, no, listen, listen. I'm going to interrupt you. It's not what they give you. It's what you bring. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, it's what you bring to the Lord. It's not what you see, what you're going to get out of the church. It's what you bring to the church. The church is full of people that fail one time or another. But God is, is giving you the opportunity. He is giving us this morning, as I saw Pastor, calling at our attention that we have to minister to young people. It's our duty. He's giving us an opportunity to learn to wash the feet of these young people. To bring him to the way. Not to bring him to the church, to bring him to the way. I'm going to repeat that. Not to bring him to the church, bring him to the God of the church. They have to learn. They have to learn because they are inundated by a bunch of stuff that you and I never had before. Technology is drowning them. And 
such a way that they cannot even breathe or think for a minute that there is a superior being that is in charge of everything. I don't know if you are, and I don't want to get out of the subject, I don't know if you listen to the news, but they are letting go of the libraries, of the different libraries in Los Angeles. They are about to close several libraries because technology is taking over. It's the sign of the times, and we here the church have to be aware of that. I'm not going to say things that I'm going to say tonight to another degree that is to call to our attention that we have to be responsible. The young people come here in the morning, Sunday morning, and they are in and out, in and out of this church, in and out. They cannot stay put one second. In the middle of the, of the uh, worship, in the middle of the prayer, they are in and out, in and out. They cannot stay still. <coughs> Pastor cannot do everything. I'm not defending him. We know that. He, he cannot do everything. We are responsible. Parents are responsible. You know, if I would be a pastor of the church, I wouldn't allow, and I won't say this without due respect, you turn your phone on, on in my church, you're out. Now you're going to say to me, yeah, but I have the Bible in my church, in my phone. I said, well, you're going to have to bring a Bible. But you don't turn your phone on. You have to learn to deal with the Bible. This man on Friday, he said to me, I bet that you're going to call to me in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And I said, well, I wasn't thinking in that one. I said, but that's a good one that you can apply to yourself. <clears throat> I'm going to give you one. It's the same one that I told him, Dennis. Be still and know that I'm God. Then as you cannot be still, and I told the same, same thing to that person on Friday, Saturday, Friday night, you cannot be still, and I don't mean be still physically, I mean be still in your heart. When the Lord is washing the feet of these disciples, they are all in one place, but their heart is all over the place. Read it with care. Read chapter 22 of the book of Luke. The book of Luke. It is says there in the book, Jesus knew that the time had come when he had to go to the cross. When he is in the Last Supper, because that's the picture of the Last Supper, chapter 15, 14. In his mind is that he's got, he's going to leave. He's got to go to the cross. When is the last time you went to the cross? I ask God this morning, what do you want from me? I'm doing the best I can. I have some problems that I don't know how to solve. And I'm doing the best I can. And the answer always comes the same. Yes, you are doing it. You don't allow me to do it. See, I have a tendency like anybody else to take over my life. And to think that I can do better. I'm teaching discipleship on Thursdays. And the first principle that you learn in discipleship is to deny yourself. This is the end of the ministry of the Lord. Chapter 15 and 14. And they haven't learned that. And the Lord says to them, Let not your heart be troubled. And then there are questions in that chapter, chapter 14, but he says, I'm going to the Father, and they are 
They don't know what he's talking about. It's a, it's a sad picture. Read it with care. It's a sad picture. It says, show us the way. Show us the Father. They don't know what he's talking about. Three years. Three years and they have seen no kind of miracles. There are people in the church with a long, long, long standing in the church that they don't know what it's about. It's about how I pay the rent and how I pay the house and how I pay the property and how this and how that about things in this world. Lord help me. It's not about that. It's about allowing him to wash my feet and change my heart. Pastor was teaching us this morning one verse in the Bible. It says, in the verses that he taught us was, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. Now, when you go to the Bible and you study that, instead of amiss, it says hamartasso. And hamartasso is synonymous of sin. Hamartasso is, you miss the, the, the blank. You should with an arrow, and you miss the target. That's what it really means. You ask, but you don't hit the target because you ask him wrong. That's what we don't receive. Because in the first, in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, and I'm going to make you tired to repeat this verse over and over again. It tells me how I have to behave. I have to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The kingdom of God in His righteousness and everything shall be added unto me. He doesn't say that I have to be perfect. I just have to seek it. Brother Ben brought us a, a teaching on of Saturday. A, a teaching that is a, it's very dear to me. That, that uh, chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. When this king He's been attacked by a force that he knows that he cannot defeat. It's a beautiful teaching. And the first thing that he does is to run to the temple and start pleading to God not to forget that they are his people. And when you read the previous chapters, you see why that is happening. See, people. We in the church, we popularize some chapters in the Bible. Second, Second Chronicles 20 is a very popular passage. But the ones prior to that are not. And the reason that, that is happening to that, yeah, and key us of that, is because prior to that happening in chapter uh, 20, he had made a covenant with some kings that they are not from God. He, were, he was trusting in, in, in the heaven that dealings with all those kings that were opposers to God, thinking that by doing that, Israel will have peace. Why I point that way? Because God had to teach that king to trust in him alone. We have to learn that in the Bible, in the church. We have to learn to go to the cross. We have to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to the power of the Holy Spirit to wash our feet. I have to learn to wash the feet of my brother. I had a very uncomfortable day today. I got it. I don't know if you can tell. Probably. I saw a person here today in the church and I didn't want to say hello to that person. I, I confess that in front of you. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to that person. And then as I was going home, the Lord said to me, are you going to preach tonight about washing the feet? <laughs> now I'm going to have to call that person and apologize. 
regardless of what this person is going to react, I have to humiliate myself and say, forgive me, I was wrong. Be careful, my dear brothers, not to allow human religious tradition to take over your spiritual life. See, the apostles were Jews. They, they were in, a, in some expectation. They were waiting for the Messiah. And they had pictured the Messiah. They had to be in a certain way. Their personality had to be in a certain way. And what he was going to do was certain things. There are passages in the Bible that you cannot afford not to study and to learn the meaning of that. What is the Last Supper and the significance of that in your life? The other one is the Sermon of the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the Book of Matthew. You cannot afford to be a Christian without studying those chapters. I remember the first time that I read chapter 5 of the book of Matthew and I thought to myself, this is a joke. This is impossible. Knowing the world that I come from. See, please listen to what I'm going to say. I know the life that I lived before I went to the, came to the Lord. I'm not proud of that life. But you see, when I came here, I didn't say anything to anybody about the places I've been, the things that I've done, and the things that I've been involved in. Very few people have been involved in things that I have been involved in my life. I was a foolish, stupid young man. I thought that I was going to save the world. I thought that I was going to change some country. No, not some country. Some countries. And I did a lot of crazy things. The other night I was watching the news and I saw these soldiers that they are rebels killing the soldiers of the government. They were down in the knees. And they were, the, the, the rebels were behind them. And they killed them all. And then they show another one right after, where they behead two, the head of two soldiers of the government. They beheaded right there, right in front of their blood. Men, Lead to their devices becomes an animal. It doesn't solve anything. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The world has a way to do things. Jesus has another way. Friday night after I was talking to this person, because I just, I just couldn't do it anymore, you know. He was arguing every point that I made. I said, listen, I didn't come here to, to, to get a prize or anything. I said, you know, I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. I just want to say what I know of the Bible and what it tells me. Unless you allow the Holy Spirit to take over the feelings that you have, you will be able to solve this problem. Unless I, Carlos, allow the Holy Spirit to wash my feet, to wash my heart, I will fail time after time. There are going to be 
big problems in the life of each one of us that you cannot solve. I cannot change absolutely nobody or anything. I cannot change my sons, I cannot change my wife, I cannot change nobody. I just have to love them. I just have to love them. When Pastor was saying this morning, I don't know if you heard the voice of the Lord, he quoted First Peter. Mm -hmm. He said, I have the capacity to interfere my communication with the Lord in my prayer life if I don't allow the Holy Spirit to wash my feet and to forgive everybody and not to have the feelings that I have to some things. Why am I talking like that tonight? Not only because I've been going through a very hard time in the morning, morning anything, I want you to know I'm preaching to myself. But I really believe that this church is a moment, this church is in a moment of transition. I believe that with my heart. Good things are happening here. God is bringing people that I never thought that they were going to stay. People, I, I, I see some of the people Excuse me, some of the brothers and sisters coming with interest to the classes of discipleship and asking questions and doing things that I don't, I don't think uh, happened before. I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody. I just say that's what happened. The Bible Institute is functioning. The students of the Bible Institute are different. They're asking questions. They are really getting into it. It is entirely up to us, the ones who have been here for a little while, to get up from where we are and start washing their feet. Let's not be so self-obsessed, so self-centered, to think that it's only about me, because it's not. It's about the body of Christ. You got no idea what I feel about this church, about this body of Christ here. This body of Christ here, you, brothers and sisters, saved my life. When I came here about, what, four or five years ago? God, I was glad. I remember standing, sitting there at the table that we used to do the Bible studies. We've been adding to, okay, let's hear what these people have to say. Because mm. I, had, I had it up to deal with church. Never in my dreams thought that I was going to stay. I came because brothers had been brought me. Because he knew I was in a bad place. He says, come on, you wash my feet, you see? He brought me here. And uh, then when we were leaving, he says, I think you have tomorrow. I said, no. He said, no, no, no. But then the next day I came by myself. And when he was, when I was coming in, he looked at me and he smiled. And I haven't been able to be. And the Lord has rebuilt my life here. Because you, to your pastor, wash my feet. He didn't know that you were washing my feet. He just knew me because he remembered that I was a teacher in the Bible Institute. That I needed somebody to show me some care. And you people have done that. So I exhorted the love of the Lord. Continue doing that. 
We have young people. The guy is sending us here to take care of, to love them, to teach them, and to be patient with them. I have a young fellow there in my house. My grandson lives with me. And I wanted to kill him every other week, but it's okay. I, when I said I want to kill him, I just... <laughs> but, but the thing is, you know, that I love him so much that I just wanted to teach him. And I don't lose hope that someday I will see him coming in this church or some other church. So I exhort you the love of the Lord. To study the those passages that I gave because I got another two teachings regarding this passage. Chapter 13 and 14 of the book of John. 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. Chapter 6 of the book of John. Chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews. They're all together. 